All right, so this is going to be the last set of notes on Chapter 17. It is January 6, 2021. Um, probably that we won't soon forget in our country's history, but you know, that's a story for another time and for all time. Um, but anyway, I want to finish up the notes today. Uh, mostly we're going to talk about the labor movements late in the uh, 19th century and uh, kind of their effect overall on the country. Um, remember the quiz will be Friday, uh, packet will be due uh, Friday as well. So let's go ahead and continue right on. All right. Uh, so the other days, the last couple of days, we've been talking about, uh, how the industrial growth has impacted the country and, uh, the fortunate few who have been able to benefit financially from the economic growth. However, the other side of that, uh, deals with the circumstances faced by the worker, the immigrant laborer, the laborer in general, who does the work um, which the wealthy manage to, to benefit off of substantially. And uh, the ordeals and the challenges that these uh, individuals are forced to face and deal with, um, you know, become pretty substantial and become a driving force for labor change as we head into the 20th century. Okay. So the other side, again, we're talking here about the immigrant labor. The immigrant labor is easily influenced, is relatively uneducated, easy to take advantage of, and most importantly, to the factory, easily replaced. Um, that makes them expendable, uh, and that allows for factories and, and, and other places to keep wages relatively low uh, because of the skill necessary for the worker is, is, of course, very limited. Now, with America growing tremendously late in the 19th century, we see this massive growth uh, and expansion in the working class. Working class immigrants fuel the economy just as much as these wealthy businesses do late in the 19th century, right? Because they bring workers over that are able to do the work that um, needs to be done to keep up the pace of increasing production in this country. With them, of course, comes the ethnic tensions that exist back in their home countries in Europe. The tensions that exist between Italians and Germans and British and, and uh, Irish and uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, remain and come over to America and exist there um, as well as these working class people are competing for the same jobs. So ethnic tensions are on the rise um, as these people are, are trying to get the same uh, employment and the same jobs. So obviously the ordeals need to be helped and aided by um, new and different ideas. Before we get to unions, which we'll get to in a little bit, there's other alternative ideas that uh, emerge as well. Uh, one of the most, well, okay. Uh, first, you have one called the Socialist Labor Party, which was the first attempt at a socialist political party in the United States. Uh, obviously, as you would imagine, and as is the case today, socialism, fortunately for us all, has never really caught on in the United States. And... Um, Though they did have some supporters, the Socialist Labor, Labor Party uh, that emerged uh, here in the 1870s never gained uh, a ton of support. They did have a charismatic leader, a guy by the name of Daniel de Leon. Um, this isn't going to look good, but whatever. Um, they did have a charismatic leader, but were never able to gain uh, a substantial amount of support. Uh, they reemerged just as the Socialist Party uh, of America in the early 20th century um, with new leadership, but also still struggle to gain support. Uh, another alternative that gains a little bit more support is the concept of Georgism. Uh, Henry George um, was a uh, leader uh, during this time who came up with alternative ideas to deal with the circumstances he felt were plaguing the American worker. While Henry George wasn't a socialist, uh, he believed that the tax system was not favorable to, uh, or the, the really the economic system was not favorable to the average American. 
um, the typical working class American. So he comes up with a concept that we've seen a lot of other people try to implement over the years, uh, but he's the first to kind of come up with it. It's a concept called the single tax. Now it's important to note that he comes up with this idea uh, you know, during the 1870s and 1880s. So in the 1870s and 1880s, we didn't yet have income tax in the United States. Uh, but Georgia's single tax was uh, an idea, and I'm going to try to simplify it a little bit from what the book says, because uh, Georgism, as it's called, named after Henry George, the idea behind it, behind the single tax, um, is that there'd be a land tax um, that becomes the primary means of government funding, okay? Um, so basically, um, land surpluses, tax surpluses, would be given back to the people. In other words, at the end of the year, whatever tax surpluses the government made off of this land tax would be distributed equally to the American people, okay? Essentially, what this is saying is the government owns all of the land, okay? And um, people basically rent land from the government, and the amount of land you rent would determine the amount of tax you have to pay. Okay, so all land is essentially owned by the government and rented to the people. All right, so this is an alternative idea with how to deal with, um, you know, the growing economic problems and differences that exist, again, between the very wealthy and the poor. Uh, this is an important concept. Uh, hopefully, I was able to simplify it for you a little bit versus what the, versus what the book says, but that's basically what the, the single tax is. Um, others try to implement similar things over the years. There's still proponents of a single tax or a flat tax, uh, but, uh, you know, it's never really totally taken off. Um, now, of course, how well did these work? Not very well, because not, uh, neither of these ideas either gain a lot of popularity, Socialist Labor Party, or ever actually get implemented with the single tax. But, again, they're new ideas to drive forward things for the future. Okay, so let's move on. Um, I don't know why this is here. We kind of already talked about the problems of monopoly in yesterday's video. Monopoly, um, you know, has its challenges. And, uh, you know, we have ways, uh, d different things that we use to try to combat that. Uh, but we'll get back into monopoly a little bit more when we get to chapter 19. So let's just move ahead. So with these ideas, even though they fail, uh, to a certain degree, the, the single tax and the Socialist Labor Party. They do help us move towards concepts of er early organized labor, okay? Um, look, uh, circumstances for workers in the 1870s are bad. More and more workers are working in factories. Uh, there's very few things protecting workers in factories. Uh, wages are low. Working conditions are poor. Um, there's no health benefits. Uh, there's no workman's compensation, right? You know, look, if you work in a meatpacking plant and, you know, you screw up, you know, trying to work, you know, cut the meat up and you cut your hand off or something like that, well, you know, there's no compensation for that. You lose your job. You know, it's pretty, it's pretty cutthroat. It's pretty straightforward. Why do you lose your job? Because if I own the factory, I say, you know, so I got a guy that gets maimed at work, can't do the job anymore. That's fine because there's 10 more guys outside that want that job, okay? All the leverage at this point belongs to uh, the corporation, belongs to the factory, okay? Uh, so they don't feel like they need to make the working conditions good. They don't feel like they need to offer some sort of insurance benefit um, or better wages or workman's compensation. There's no reason to do that because if you're unhappy with the job, you can leave because there's people, there's 10 people outside want your job right now, okay? So the workers are really kind of stuck and they have no representation. Child labor uh, is a rough thing. Children come over. Uh, they got a family to support. The money that dad's making at the factory isn't enough to support the family. So... Rather than going to school, a lot of these children have to get jobs in the factories themselves. As you notice here, uh, you know, you got a kid here that's working on a, on a machine, dangerously doesn't even have shoes, okay? Uh, these are common dangers and common things that families that come over to America are forced to face and deal with. 
helping create a cycle of poverty that will go from one generation to the next. All right. So how do we fix this situation? Well, obviously, you're going to do that through unionization, through organized labor. Okay, but it's not going to be an easy process, right? Uh, one of the big themes we're going to be talking about this semester is organized labor through a lot of the chapters. You know, I said how we're kind of done talking about Native Americans, um, more or less. Uh, one of the big issues that we find this semester is going to be uh, the advancement and changes made in organized labor. Now, unionization is an interesting thing. Um, the earliest unions, one of the earliest ones was a group called the Molly Maguires, which were primarily coal, uh, Irish immigrants that were coal miners. Um, they unionized because they didn't like the way they were treated working in the coal mines. Unfortunately for them, their methods were pretty violent. The Molly Maguires were basically terrorists. They uh, would bomb uh, places. They killed uh, there were instances where they murdered, like, foremen at, uh, at different coal mines and stuff like that. It doesn't give a very good um, impression. It doesn't give a very good impression of the efforts of unions. And it's going to make it really hard for unions to outgrow this ideology or this belief that unions are violent groups um, that really aren't trying to accomplish anything good for America, and they're, they're more dangerous than they are good. Molly Maguire's helped to perpetuate that ideology, okay? Another uh, event that isn't good for unions is uh, the um, railroad strike of 1877, okay? And this happens in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and, and West Virginia primarily, and there's a big railroad strike that happened as a result, again, of a wage cut for the rail workers so they so they went on strike and they rioted and uh, over the course of several weeks, um, the railroad strike uh, um, ended up killing over a hundred people. Um, the National Guard had to be called out, et cetera, et cetera. Not a good look for the con the ideas of unionization, and it sets a precedent that we're going to see in the early days of unions, where the federal government is always going to side on the side, not of the unions, but the government is going to support the business. Which makes sense for the government to do that, whether or not it's right, because businesses make money. It seems all these unions are doing is making violence. Okay, So therefore, perhaps the best measure, the best thing for the union to do um, um, or the best thing for the government to do, I should say, is to, um, you know, support the big business because that makes sense. So early unionization is fraught with problems uh, because it's not well run. It's um, centered around like these violent acts and these violent groups, and it's going to be a really hard situation for the unions to shake. Sometimes, in the case of the Molly Maguires, the railroad strike, some others later on, deservedly so. Some of these groups can be violent and socialistic, uh, but unions that really want to accomplish some good are kind of bogged down with the idea that they're not, um, you know, that, that, that they're not violent, okay? Um, so again, that kind of answers the question of why no public support. All right, so last slide. Uh, so let's talk a little bit more about some of these more labor union issues and riots and problems, okay? Um, so the first real labor union in the United States of America is called the Knights of Labor. The Knights of Labor was a labor union that was open to anybody that worked in a labor-intensive type of job, miners, railroad workers, factory workers, etc. cetera, okay? Um, there were no real um, prerequisites for being a member of the Knights of Labor, okay? So anybody could join, women, uh, any workers, I'm not sure about minorities, but I, I assume they could probably as well, which sounds really inclusive and really great. But the problem is they have very little bargaining power, okay? Um, the whole goal of a union 
is to increase the bargaining power of the worker. If we band together, maybe we can get some change. You know, like I said before, you know, one worker gets hurt on the job and wants compensation. Yeah, I don't have to give it to you because I got 10 people that want your job, right? There's 10 people waiting outside for work. But if everybody in the factory says, we're not going to work unless this guy gets taken care of, all of a sudden you might not have enough people to be able to replace those workers right away. So you have to maybe find a way to bargain with them. The whole idea is to increase bargaining power. The problem for the Knights of Labor is that the, the workers, the people that are members of it, don't tend to be skilled laborers. Therefore, they are very replaceable. But the Knights of Labor is important because it is our first significant labor union. Later on comes the American Federation of Labor. Now, I want you to be able to distinguish the difference between the AFL and the Knights of Labor. The AFL is, our, is another early labor union, but the difference there is it was only open to skilled workers, typically only males. The AFL succeeds where the Knights of Labor fail because of this. It represents skilled workers. You need skilled workers to, um, you know, com you know, to complete certain jobs or whatever is necessary to be done at the factory or elsewhere. They're less replaceable than members of the Knights of Labor would be. Therefore, they're forced. Uh, the the businesses, the factories, are forced to bargain with the Knights, uh, with the uh, with the AFL, with the American Federation of Labor, a little bit more. The AFL still exists today. It's one of our largest labor unions. It was led by a man named Samuel Gompers. He's not quite a super important AP point, but I want you to be very aware of who Samuel Gompers was. He was America's first great labor leader, and he led uh, the American Federation of Labor for like 40 to 50 years from the from the 18, late 1870s or 80s, all the way up to his death in the 1920s. And he's the man who really puts labor unions on the map in the United States, giving them influence, giving them power, and allowing them to grow. Samuel Gompers is a key figure in the history of labor. He may be the most important person, uh, really, in the history of American labor unions. And we see labor unions all over today in, in all kinds of things, whether it's public employees, Obviously, for labor-intensive workers, there's teachers' unions in the public schools. There's unions for professional athletes, okay? All of them kind of owe a debt of gratitude to Samuel Gompers for really advocating and working hard to um, speak to the needs of the American worker and create a system that allows for the American worker to um, really have their rights recognized as well. Okay, so a few more important riots I want to talk about really quick, and the book covers these as well. The three key riots, labor riots, that occur late in the 19th century um, are the Haymarket bombing, the Homestead strike, and the Pullman strike. The Haymarket bombing happens in 1886 in Chicago, a place called Haymarket Square. This is what kind of ruins the Knights of Labor. Um, there was a labor protest, uh, there was a labor strike going on in this square, and randomly there's a bombing. Um, and uh, it turns out the, the Knights of Labor weren't responsible for the bombing, but they were blamed for it because, you know, people believe at this time that labor unions are dangerous. And uh, we saw it with the Molly Maguires, we saw it with the uh, railroad strike, okay? Um, it was a group of anarchists that actually set off the bomb and it killed some police officers and some other people, but it discredits the Knights of Labor and ultimately leads to the Knights of Labor kind of disbanding and falling apart, making the AFL the clear most influential and most important labor union. Okay, Moving forward to our second big labor strike uh, is the Homestead strike that actually happens at Carnegie Steel in Pennsylvania, Homestead, Pennsylvania. Basically what happened was uh, there was a blast furnace explosion and a worker was killed and uh, workers were frustrated because there was no compensation and nothing to take care of this man's family. Coupled with some other frustrations, um, 
so the guys went on strike. Uh, this again, I'm sorry, this is in 1892, I think. Yeah, 1892. Um, so by this time, the um, man kind of running uh, Carnegie Steel was a guy by the name of Henry Frick, who's really an interesting historical figure. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, would refuse to negotiate with the, uh, with the unions or anything like that. And it led to the point where all the workers, uh, you know, at the Homestead plant went ahead and went on strike. They go on strike. They stand outside the front of the, um, uh, outside in front of the factory, uh, basically preventing replacement workers from, um, excuse me, uh, preventing replacement workers from going in and taking their spot. So the response from Frick, who was the type of guy who wasn't going to put up with any nonsense, um, calls on the government to intervene. And the government sent in um, these people called the Pinkertons. Uh, now, this is before we really had a secret service, so to speak. So the Pinkertons were like this hired out security force that kind of played the role of the secret service to the presidents before we had the secret service. Uh, but these Pinkerton guards came in to break up the riot. Some violence ensued and uh, about 11 people were killed. Again, not a good look for Carnegie Steel, not a good look for labor unions, and as has always been the trend, the government intervenes and, of course, intervenes on the side of big business. It wouldn't be for a while, not till the 20th century, that we're going to see the government intervene in a labor uh, dispute on the side of, um, on the side of labor. Okay, uh, so that's the second big one. A couple years later in Chicago, there's the Pullman strike. A little less violent, but it doesn't, re it doesn't really result in much death. But the Pullman strike, or any death really, happens in 1894 in um, the Pullman Palace Car Company. Uh, basically, so George Pullman had uh, built this... Uh, uh, car company, Pullman Palace Car Company, where they would make uh, like train cars, ones where the ones for, for when people would travel by train. Um, and because this is before people had driving cars, uh, what would happen with a lot of these companies is they would build homes and things nearby uh, the factory so people could walk to work every day. Um, and a lot of the workers would be required to live in this model community uh, for the, uh, you know, for the workers. Well, because financial times were tough by 1894 because of the Panic of 1893, which we'll get into again in Chapter 19, um, Pullman cuts wages, okay? And uh, the American Railway Union gets involved, led by a guy named Eugene Debs, who becomes a really kind of important political figure, um, kind of, I guess, a big socialist, a bit of a Bernie Sanders of his day. He runs for president like four or five times. He never really comes close to winning, obviously. But anyway, um, they intervene, uh, you know, on the side of the, um, on the side of the workers. One thing leads to another. The workers go on strike. They're upset because there's a 25% wage cut, but there's not a proportionate cut in the, um, in the rents for these homes that they're forced to live in. Um, like I said before, Debs. And of course, government intervention happens again. And of course, as you would expect, the government intervenes, you guessed it, on the side of Pullman, on the side of the big business. All of these establish the idea that labor unions are not well supported by the government. And when it comes down to supporting either big business or uh, the labor union, the companies, uh, I'm sorry, the government is always going to side with the companies, kind of establishing that relationship between big business and politics and the government, okay? Like I said before, while the Pullman strike isn't a violent strike necessarily, it does help to kind of further that idea 
um, that uh, you know it's really hard for the uh, for the unions to get ahead and uh, move forward you know, given the circumstances that they're forced to deal with. So anyway, that's, uh, that's it for chapter 17. Uh, if you have any questions about any of this stuff, shoot me an email and, uh, we'll see you next time. All right.